This is Karen from Karen B. Wolf Interiors. Welcome to Design Pop, my trend series. This is our third one, and I'm so excited to have you here. Today we have a guest, Catherine, you wanna wave? I hope you can see her. Hi everyone, nice to meet you guys. <laughs> this technology is not so easy, but um, so this will be a little bit of trial and error, but I wanted to welcome you, and we're gonna have a conversation about art, decorative art, fine art, art for the home, what's trending in art, and um, I'm very excited. But before I go ahead and do that, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about KBW Interiors, Karen B. Wolf Interiors. Um, let me share my screen. So let's see. So here we are. Um, we are a boutique full service design firm, and you know we're, we're known for layering um, or layered modern interiors, with thoughtful inclusions of color and texture. Um, but what I haven't touched on, and I think that in the past, you know, I've done these series, I haven't discussed really why I'm doing this and who I am. So I just wanted to go backwards a little bit. Um, I've decided to do this series, it was really a whim um, when this coronavirus hit and everybody felt so isolated in their homes. And I felt like my creative mind was going to explode with ideas. And so I decided to put this this series together really to give back but in a very meaningful way to designers and to design lovers. So this series is targeted for both types of users and we're toggling between I'd say you know information that's practical and useful but also really um, in-depth design information. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is you know why me? Why am I putting this together and not somebody else? So I started my career as a trends forecaster um, about 25 years ago in the home industry. And I've been in and out of that portion of my career for the last 25 years. And since I've, I've started and owned Karen B. Wolf Interiors, my focus has been on bringing fashion forward and trend based product into the home, but in a timeless way. And I write on that topic and blog on it. And I have some, um, I'm considered a, hopefully, an industry voice on consumer design trends. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of background. And moving forward, um, we plan on bringing other industry experts as a panelist into our series. So let me introduce you to Catherine, who I'm so excited to have here from Mason Lane. Um, I met Catherine a couple of months ago, on, at, on a, basically through another colleague. And she's one of the most approachable art advisors I've met in the industry. We automatically just connected. So let me pass it over to Catherine and have her introduce herself. Um, who she Thank is. You, You're welcome. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Catherine Earnhardt. I'm the founder of Mason Lane Art Advisory. And we are a boutique art advisory firm that prides ourselves on being approachable and being transparent. And we help clients seeking storied emerging art for their home. And uh, one of the things that really distinguishes our firm is our ability to understand client taste and nurture that taste so that they get pieces that they get long, they get pieces in their home that they really get long-term enjoyment from. And so I'm happy to be here to answer any questions about art and go through a few of the differences between fine and decorative and just help you navigate this world that tends to be pretty elusive to people. So let me just back up for a second. So as a design firm, we spec a lot of art and you know, not all designers do. We actually go to that end to that ninth degree or 10th degree or whatever. And we bring in a lot of art. And then sometimes we get to a point where we have special locations in the home that require something that is better than decorative art. Um, or the client is a collector or wants to start a collection. And at that point then, I check out and I then go to an advisor like Catherine as a designer, but I don't always have to go to a Catherine. You can go to her directly if you are listening to this and you don't want to go through a designer like me. When a designer gets involved with an art advisor, it adds value because we are able to, you know, basically consider the art in its environment um, in addition to just bringing the art to you. But Catherine also has a really you know, cultured eye, and she can help you navigate that as well. So I'm just explaining when and why you would have the use of an art advisor. So the other thing I really wanted to touch on was basically what is the difference between decorative and fine art, and like why are we specking decorative art 
and when should we be bringing in fine art? So I'm going to let Catherine kind of discuss what her take is on the differences. Sure. So I think every home, there's a place for both in every home. I mean, in even my own home, we work on a save and splurge philosophy, and that's true for <laughs> every client. Right. It has to be. Um, to me, fine art is done by artists who have studied art history. They have a interest in furthering the story of art history and being part of it. And their work and the process and the materials that they use are absolutely paramount to the sale of any individual work. They're really using art as a means of communication. Decorative art, in my mind, is usually made um, out of a personal passion or hobby. A lot of times it's made for a specific space in a home to match or to look pretty in that space, or it's made out of um, a desire for financial gain. So those are my main difference. So I have a question for you. When, so what's an emerging fine artist versus like, dec so what are the categories? So there's decorative art, there's emerging fine artists, and then there's a fine artist, and then is there a museum art? Like where, what are the categories? Good of question. Art? So we specialize in emerging to mid-career. Emerging are um, new artists that are on the scene that are being recognized as fine artists, meaning they have studied art history. They're being represented generally by galleries that, show other fine artists. Um, I would say the levels are emerging art, mid-career artists, and established. Do you have to study fine art to be considered a fine artist? Usually. Artists go to school for a long time. They pay a lot of money for their education. Photographers as well, which everyone thinks photography is cheaper. It is, um, and anyone can snap a picture, but photography is, fine art photography is its own, um, proper academic area that people study and then become fine artists. So where you go to school, do you think that that matters? The, your pedigree, your degree? It does matter a lot. <laughs> I would say that it matters just as much as it does in the academic world. You know, of course, the leading art schools in the nation are going to get you in front of the more important art critic eyes. And that serves as a, as leverage for your career. But then just as in the normal, in the non-art world, there are people who went to a non-Ivy League school or whatever the lower left, like any school that's not Harvard, and they still are okay. Like it's a wide variety of people, but the best schools basically are a indicator and a, sig a signal to the top critics and the top galleries. Um, but of course there are many other people who end up being successful, but a lot of galleries initially before they even look at work, they will look at the resume of an artist. Wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah. In the modern art movement, weren't there artists like Jasper Johns who didn't, I mean, maybe he did go to school, but that were part of a movement that basically changed and shifted the trajectory. Yeah, the structure was different then, but he okay. was part of a school of artists and got his name for being part of that school and being trained under specific artists who were internationally recognized. So they didn't go to the same formal forms of education, but they were, it was similar because they were trained by key people in the art world and therefore had more visibility through those people. So I'm going to go to that, back to that question in a second, because I actually have a sure. question about if I remember it, but for if I have a client though who or you're just listening to this and you want to start bringing fine art into your house like you've had enough of the decorative art how do you advise um, somebody to look at that piece of art how are you bringing that piece of art into your house and are you doing it for an investment great question so the first thing I teach people to think about when they're interested in buying art is to stop thinking about whether you love it or hate it because when you think about that, the answer is one or the other. It's very, it's a very short answer and it's a very short relationship that you end up having with that piece of art. Instead, I encourage people to think, is it interesting to you? And if it's interesting, um, or if it's not, when you're assessing the answer to that question, whether it's interesting or not, then you can assess three ways. One, aesthetically. Is it interesting aesthetically? Are the colors uncomfortable? Are they loud? Are they soothing? Are they strange to you? So you kind of assess the aesthetics. Is, do you know what it is? Is it recognizable? Is it abstract? Assess it aesthetically. Two, 
what is it made out of? Sometimes that's super straightforward, like oil paint on paper um, or canvas. And other times it's not. There's this thing called a photogram that's a great example of this, where it's considered part of photography, but it's a light sensitive paper that is, is exposed to light in a unique way. Um, so that gets into what is it made of? And third, what is the process? How did the artist create this using the materials that you now understand? Is it a process that you could really do yourself? Is it something that you would never even think of? Is, it, is there a story behind it? Once you evaluate an artwork in those ways and think, is it interesting to me aesthetically, material-wise, and process, you develop a much longer term relationship with that piece and it helps you one appreciate it to understand the value behind it because pricing and quality is is a mystery to a lot of people in the art world but that helps to drive the value but three most importantly you are establishing a connection to that piece that will potentially last a long time because you're relating yourself to that piece you're thinking is it interesting to me does it remind me of anything can i get can this prompt any memories for me? And I also think that, you know, to that point, we often tell people to, if they want to start collecting art to do it while they travel, because typically then there's a story involved and there's an already a connection. Um, mm -hmm. because they can relate it back to a location, time, place, a good memory. Um, the, you're right. The story is key. The story is why you get long-term enjoyment out of it. Some people are nervous that they're going to buy a piece of art and get sick of it. The story is what helps you not get sick of it. So as an art advisor, like you can help people create a story with a piece because you will show people, for example, the artist studio or the story behind the art or, or explain to them the process and why it's so unique, I'm assuming, right? That's so, all we do. Like we're, I, I sort of dislike when people define their career as storyteller because that's so broad it's not specific but really we create stories for people in their home we create stories all the time and it's it's uh, it's really establishing a connection the important part of storytelling is helping you relate to something and there are stories behind the art that we um, present I never present any art to someone that I don't really believe in and then I don't feel that they will connect with and so that's it's the story of how they bought it and it's also the story of how it was created and I know one time I was doing a project for a client and they asked me well how do I know that this piece of art is going to you know um, that it's a good investment that it's going to appreciate and I was like well you can't buy art like that you know but I didn't have the the formal answer, and I know you did a whole dissertation on this, but in, in a nutshell, like what's your feeling about buying fine art as an investment and, you know, what would yeah. you recommend for people? Okay, very important point is that art is a terrible investment. Like you shouldn't buy it purely for investment purposes. It's extremely liquid, um, but that said, it's nice to buy something that will appreciate and there are ways to assess that there's no crystal ball with any of this but there's no crystal ball with real estate or the stock market um but the best way to think about it is in the same way you would assess, assess a stock for a traditional financial market um when you're looking to buy a stock you think about well what is the company uh selling is this good something that is sold elsewhere or is it unique who is leading this company? Does this person have any background in leading successful companies? Three, who else is investing in the company? Four, what press is it getting? And five, uh, hmm, I'm forgetting five. Let's go with those four for now. Um, and for art, it's the same thing. You know, think about what is this artist creating? Is it different than anything I've seen before? Who is representing that? Is that gallery um, reputable? And do they have a reputation for building artist crews? Three, who else is collecting the work? And four, what other artists or museums or um, collectors are purchasing that artist's work? So on that topic, you know, I think as a designer especially, but I'm sure everyone else is curious too, like who are the artists to watch today? I know like Damien Hirst was a big one a couple of years ago with the butterflies mm -hmm. and, you know, he kind of, blew up the art scene who do you think is going to blow up the art scene are any of these i know you gave me four names 
if you can walk me through, you know, sure. who, who these artists are and why you think they're, they're the ones that are coming next. Or sure. are so here. these are a list of some of my favorites that I truly believe in investment wise. And again, you shouldn't buy purely on investment, but I always want every one of my clients to buy wisely. And knowing that it's a solid um, spend is part of that. So my, one of my favorites is Raymond Hendler. He was an American who died in 1998. He was actually friends with Jackson Pollock and Franz Klein. And he, his work was much softer than Jackson Pollock's, if you think about how aggressive his work was. Um, Hendler's was much softer. It's over there on the lower right. Um, he does these biomorphic forms that created this little visual language. It was kind of like graffiti art 50 years before graffiti art actually was a thing. Because it was softer, people didn't pay a lot of attention to it because it was in an era when people were angry and emotional <laughs> and um, passionate. Yeah. And so his work was seen and well known then, but after he died, it fell off the radar completely. And there was this gallery called Barry Cam Campbell Gallery in Chelsea that researched undervalued abstract expressionists. And they found his work. They actually found his widow. She was working at Home Depot at the time. They found her. They uncovered hundreds of his works um, from his estate, ended up representing his estate and have brought him to the market. And his prices have um, he's done very well and his prices have steadily increased over the past seven years. So he is absolutely an artist to watch and especially these artists from that period. Um, the top ones, Jackson Pollock have gotten too expensive for any normal human to afford. So people are looking at these under discovered ones and Hendler is one of those, but his prices will very likely go up. So what about, ones, oh, sorry. I was going to yeah. say Valdez whose work is kind of on the more affordable side. <laughs> Amanda Valdez is one of my favorite emerging artists. She is a Brooklyn-based artist repped by a fantastic gallery called Denny Dimon Gallery. Um, her work is very textural. It's getting a lot of museum attention, and she travels internationally and gets uh, residencies with groups around the world. So she's getting a lot of international exposure and has been collected by several museums, which is a great sign for an emerging artist. Um, Similar yeah. thing with Sam Messenger. He's a British artist repped by Davidson Contemporary here. And um, it's Davidson is the first gallery who's ever represented his works. And they're now selling for $15,000. And they're just, they don't translate well on digital. They are not translating well. So I went and looked his work up. I was really curious. And I, yeah. felt, I personally felt Amanda Valdez's work. Like I, I related to it. I love the organic shapes. I think it's very relevant. Sam Messenger was not reading for me. What is his process? 100%. So he takes, he takes a concept, okay? For example, with this piece, he takes the concept of reduction and he explores that concept. So here he is taking paint and putting it on a piece of paper and putting it out in something like the snow, okay? So it's a huge piece of paper and he puts it in the snow and then the snow kind of um, causes the paper to morph and get wet. And, um, he applies an ink and a paint to the paper. So the snow causes it to bleed all over. Then he takes plastic, he paints the plastic, puts it on the paper that's been interacting with the snow, then pulls the plastic off. So it peels some of the layers off of that paint and ink that's been, um, sitting, stewing, let's say. And then he repeats that process several times. So the texture on it is very cool. And you see all these different colors. Again, it's awful on digital, but in person, it's, so this is where you need the story behind it. And then yeah. there are pictures of him in the, like in Stad, Switzerland with his huge papers freezing. So yeah. And then what about Joanny? Did I spell her name right? I hope, I, I hope I did. It's, you did. It's Joni Tremblay. She's a Canadian artist. We love Canadian art. We actually have an office. I'm based in Brooklyn, um, but my company has a office in Toronto, which has been such a huge advantage for us getting to know the Toronto and Canadian art scene, which there's so many affordable, beautiful, collectible works of art. And Joni Tremblay is um, an artist that we love to watch. She is a Canadian. She's taking a lot of surrealist concepts and mixing them with abstraction. I think there's been, to talk about trends, a huge trend to look at more representational or realistic pieces uh, because it's abstract can get a little old. It's a little hard for people, but to incorporate um, some forms like that, she takes a lot of inspiration from Georgia O'Keeffe um, and create these little surrealist imaginative scenes yeah. is something that's very appealing to people. 
I agree. And then, you know, from my perspective, so, you know, we have fine art, which is really more about process, story, um, you know, um, technique and study. And then you have decorative art, which really parallels, I think, the style trends that we're seeing emerging. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking to, to bring decorative art into a home, we're kind of, we're paralleling the macro trends that we're seeing. So for example, um, maximalism, and I'll go to the next slide in a minute, but the main trends that we're going to, ah, why is it not working? Whoops. We're going to do a poll, but basically maxim maximalism, she tribe, new Nordic, grand millennial, modern farmhouse, escapism, and joy of aesthetics. And I talk about these trends for, in every presentation because mm -hmm. these are the current trends that we're seeing in the marketplace right now. And there's probably more, but these are the ones that I've been focusing on. So for maximalism, and right now we can actually start a poll while I talk through this. We'd love for you to vote on who your favorite or what your favorite design um, decorative art style is. So where do you see yourself? But maximalism is, you know, more is more. She Tribe is about the power of the female. And you see a lot of art that is um, female figures, whether it's heavier like the one before with Hallie Mitchell or just figurative like this. Um, New Nordic is what was once Haiji, but it's kind of cl cleaned up. It's simpler in form um, and it's Scandinavian influenced. Grand Millennial is the new millennial trend, which is infusing um, you know, kind of like roses and florals and tradition back into your space in a very pretty way where pinks, where this millennial pink and a pale blue are very common pairing. Modern farmhouse, I think we all know, but the big difference between before and now is that it's, it's much more um, upscale and much more refined than it was when Joanna Gaines was doing the farmhouse look. Escapism is really a catch-all for anything that is global, um, boho, travel-based, um, and also evoking another time or place. And then joy of aesthetics, I think, is a big trend right now, especially with all of us locked into our homes. Um, it is definitely about um, bringing joy, color, fun, and pop art into our space. Um, so these are the main trends that I'm seeing in decorative art, and I'm sure we see them also in fine art, but it's more about, you know, again, the, um, the process than it is about the, how the trend or how the art is fitting into a trend. So it looks like the grand millennial and the modern farmhouse are taking the lead. Um, they're pretty neck and neck. And last week we did a poll and those two trends won again. So wow. <laughs> I guess whoever tunes in definitely likes those trends. And, and mm -hmm. truthfully, among my group also, we all voted for Grand Millennial and Modern Farmhouse. So moving along, um, I'm going to end the poll now. Hang on a second. So, you know, I think we talked a little bit about art buying and how to access great fine art. So mm -hmm. Catherine from Mason Lane is a perfect example of how you can access it, but there are other ways as well. Wanna, do you want to talk a little bit um, briefly about the art fairs that you tend to? Yeah, sure. The art fairs are um, one of the best ways to see a ton of art in a very efficient way. It's comparable to many trade fairs um, that Karen, I'm sure you go to, High Point and whatnot, but these are open to anyone. So you can go if you're in the art world, the design world, or if you are a doctor. <laughs> Anyone can go. Um, the, my favorite fairs by far are the Art Basel Miami Beach fairs. Art Basel is the main one and then there are about 20 satellite fairs that take over the entire city and in December we actually took a group of 10 people down there for three days and did guided tours. There's a little flyer on the presentation that tells you a little bit about what we did there but it's a very efficient way as I said to see a ton of art. Every fair has a different it's kind of a different brand so art basel is the very cream of the crop super high-end art you're seeing multi-million dollar works there um and even if you're not busting out your wallet it's still a scene and it's kind of a, a walk through art history so it's very interesting to see regardless of where you're buying or not and such a scene like we walked by serena williams and i don't know who else was just 
hanging out in Art Basel. The other ones um, have a very different vibe. There's Volto, which is more emerging, as I said, some more experimental fairs, but Art Basel has it all. Um, there's also the Dallas Art Fair, which was happening last week virtually. New York Art Week wrapped up right before everyone was sheltered in place or in, at home. And uh, there was a selection of fairs, Armory, ADAA, Art and Paper, and the other art fair um, or independent art fair that are all um, part of the New York scene. I actually wrote something on my blog if anyone wants to go take a read on what they want to go to in the future. And the Toronto Art Fair happens in October, and that's an excellent way to see um, the Canadian art that I mentioned before, which is very accessible, great price point. What about the affordable art fair in New York City? The affordable art fair has the best marketing name I have ever heard. <laughs> um, everything is under 10 grand and it's also a nice way to see art. I don't encourage you to buy everything from there because it's pretty similar to going to one store, like let's say H&M and buying your whole wardrobe there. Like it feels very one note, I'll say. Um, and as I said before, I really support the Save and Splurge. And I think the story behind art is what gives it interest to you in the long run. And when you understand that story and you um, feel connected to it, then you can build a more meaningful home. So speaking of, you know, one note, we're going to get into some of um, art tips right now. Yeah. So actually I'll skip because one note speaks to mixing it up. I'll go backwards, which yeah. is our tip number four. Um, yes. You really believe in mixing art up on the walls, right? So we can 100%. see. So many times clients come to us and they can't figure out what's wrong with their wall situation. Um, and yes, nine times out of 10, it's because they have prints behind glass everywhere. Like photography, even a, I'll count a mirror. Um, photography, mirrors, like everything that's on a hard surface. And they also think that art is going to solve all their wall problems. And it's not. The best advice I can give is to mix up what you have on walls. That means putting a painting that's textural, like something not behind glass. It's so subtle, but it really adds depth to your space. Have a painting, have a sculpture, leave a wall blank have a gallery wall and a collection of pieces. That type of diversity is what makes each individual vignette seem so much more interesting um, and meaningful than just having some hard surface piece on every wall. And leaving those walls blank is really important. I really advise clients to do one to two pieces per room um, because otherwise it just, you, you create a cluttered look, which Karen, I'm sure you advise clients all the time on how to avoid that. Same thing. We usually do about two walls in a room with art. And mm -hmm. if we still feel that we need something on a wall, we'll go to a mirror or, you know, another. another or styled room. shelving or something Up like that. Out. But yeah. usually two is our maximum in every room. And I think it's innate for us. Like we do it instinctually, but yeah. it, it, you know, articulating it is super helpful. And so just going, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, but going backwards, I'm going to go through, sorry. I'm going to go through the top 10 art tips. So going back to number one, like, first of all, one of the questions that we get a lot is, you know, what, um, what style art should I put in here? What should the art look like? And obviously, if you're doing it decoratively, it's a lot easier than if you're looking at fine art, because oftentimes the fine art just doesn't match the space so to say. And I think that's one of the biggest struggles between designer, art advisor, and end user. Um, how can we bring that art, that beautiful fine art into the house? Like how do you tell people to look at it in the space? Sure. And that's not such a point. Fitting. What's that? I missed the it's last not time. quite fitting. Yeah. So that is such an interesting point. And I think that we pride ourselves on having a good design eye um, because I always want to execute the designer's vision and the client's vision and marry that. That's so important. I'm never there to change it up with some weird conceptual piece. Like I need something that is going to make everyone's heart sing. Um, so with that, I have this philosophy about the energy in the space. It's that the more color and pattern that you have in a space, the higher energy a space feels. And the opposite is also true. The less color or more muted colors, more limited color palette, the less energy a space has. So my two examples are master bedrooms, tend to be a more quiet zen place in your home um, and they have more 
a more limited color palette. Also spots, like think about it, it's all neutrals or like sage green. It's all a very limited um, color palette. Feels very zen. Opposite side of the spectrum is kids playroom or kids play space like New York Kids Club or something like that. Primary colors everywhere, very high energy. So when you're thinking about what type of art to incorporate into your space, Think about what energy you want your space to have. Think about where where the art is going. If it's going in a bedroom, you want to you, you might want a more relaxing vibe, and you might want to pick up on some of the colors there and not introduce too many more. If your living room is feeling a little bit drab and you need it to feel a little bit more lively, that's a great opportunity to introduce a few more colors so that it feels more lively, more exciting. But not crazy, like don't put primary colors everywhere. You want it to feel comfortable and still relaxing for people. And then kids' bedroom, maybe that's right. another extreme. Anything yeah. close. So what about um what about your removing art? So I know okay. that and also I should say that all these tips are from my quarantine 14 days of like inspiration. Again, Karen mentions everyone is many people are staying at home and just figuring out how to improve their home so these are things to either execute now or just to put a pin in and take some inspiration for when we can leave our homes again so um this tip is remove art remove anything you don't love remove what's damaged a lot of frames are damaged remove what doesn't work scale wise in the space um i told this to karen that a lot of people inherit art from either family members and they're probably giving it to you because they didn't really like it either so it's okay to not keep it up like you don't need to feel compelled to keep up things that don't spark joy um and as i said having empty walls gives everything else room to breathe and also gives you an opportunity if it's a big wall to get something that you really love and it's a wonderful feeling to just feel inspired and and comfortable in your home every day and i, um, I think also the family photos is a big thing because you know oftentimes it's well, we want to put our family photos in this spot and you have a million family photos, you know, um, totally. we try to redirect. Um, there's definitely a place for that, but often in private, in private spaces. A hundred percent. And then the other thing is framing, right? So framing's huge, really big. And I, I'd say we equally agree on this and, and huge. It can completely change the whole piece of art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Framing is, um, framing goes in and out of style. Frames go in and out of style, just like design, just like clothes, just like restaurants. Um, and frames from 10 years ago are different from frames now. And my, my classic example is that that cherry wood beveled frame, um, I don't have one in my home, but on my Instagram, I showed pictures of it. Um, it's not on trend anymore it screams 80s and if you take that off of a piece and reframe it in some sort of whitewash maple frame it feels or very or um like a float frame with a nice white mat that's not yellowed from years of uh sort of exposure to the sun it just feels so much more fresh and contemporary so it's a great way to change up stuff if you did inherit things or you bought something years ago that you don't love anymore consider reframing and we um you can get affordable frames today like frame bridge you can send your artwork to them mm -hmm. and they will frame it for you and wexel art is such a great resource for acrylic frames which as designers we love we did i also that. love um simply framed that's a great one too that's a great one and i put it in here it's it's actually yeah. your gallery wall tip so i know everyone's you know really interested in how do you do a gallery wall and there's templates all over the internet um and you know they're it's it's not an easy it looks it looks amazing it's not an easy thing to do on your own so Catherine has a gallery wall are we gonna go there okay i'm gonna yeah, walk everyone this works um we're gonna show you her gallery wall and then talk about how she created it um so we do gallery walls all the time for clients and my first top tip i hope it's okay that i'm moving um is to pick your frames first because it's very very annoying to have all of your images and then wonder, well, where am I going to get frames to fit this? And how do they even fit in with a frame? Because I measured an eight by 10, but now with the frame, it's 14 by 20 or something like that. So pick your frames first. We love simply framed. Okay, here we go. So I couldn't do the webinar here because I'm now in my stairwell, but this is our family gallery wall that goes down this stairwell. And a wow. few tips, pick your frames first. <laughs> 
We love Simply Framed. They have a frame called the New School Black. That's just so great for, I would say, a broad range of people um, because it doesn't feel too traditional. It doesn't feel too contemporary. It's really, it's just a crowd pleaser. Um, they're also great value, great quality. Second, um, and you can customize them for any sort of photo. Can you, can you go further back so they can see the wall a little better? There you go. So now I can really see, see the depth of that wall. It's like expansive. Did you add to this wall over time or yes. did you do it all? Every wall, I'm awkwardly sitting on my stairs. Every wall is um, a different year, sort of. Like we've committed to doing a different wall every, I try and do it the day before Thanksgiving when everyone comes. <laughs> I mean, we've tailored that. We don't have that many walls, but um, kind of that one back there is a little bit of history. Like my parents, wedding pictures um my husband are my sort of first pictures and then on these walls we've got kids going up the staircase it even goes up over here so your recommendation is to start from the middle right with the largest start piece. from the middle with the largest pieces yes exactly start from the middle with the largest pieces um always get a template we have i have this great hack that i will share with everyone we use icovia to do all of our planning for gallery walls. And it's typically a design um, software that's used for floor planning. But basically, instead of a room, instead of um, saying that that's the, giving a dimension that's supposed to be the room dimension, like let's say a room is 20 by 30 feet, I pretend that's the wall. And then I take the square that's supposed to represent a coffee table and I pretend that's the frame and I create a gallery wall like that. And if you don't have Icovia, you can go onto the West Elm website and they have a little thing that says room planner and you can use it there for free and it's great. That's great. And then if you don't want to do all the work, truthfully, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to hire somebody, you can go to Picture Wall, which has pre-designed templates for you. And then Pottery Barn also has templates that are pre-packaged. Like you could buy their frames and the template and then put the photos in there. And then the other thing I thought you said that was really great is if you are reprinting your, your photos, print it on a high quality Epson rag paper. So I know you love print space. In so important. We love print space in New York. Do not use Shutterfly or um, whatever, the, those Snapfish. The photos just don't show well, especially through the glass of a frame. The color is so different and so rich when you use a quality printer. I think Plus they can crop it appropriately, which is huge. Like you, you want it to seem balanced. The quality print will make a huge difference in the quality of your of your gallery wall. Um, can you show what a picture bumper is and why you're using that? Yes, I'm going to go back down and show you the picture bumper. But first, also, I really like a two inch gap, one to two inch gaps between all my pictures, and keep that uniform throughout. So all the verticals here are going to be this. I think it's one inch. All the um, Sorry, all the horizontals are one inch, all the verticals are that two inch. Keep that very consistent throughout your gallery wall for a really uniform look. So I put in the presentation, by the way, which if you, um, you can take the link off of the chat and put it in your browser and then you'll get the download. Or at the very um, end, I think the email, we might've gotten this worked out since last week. You should get an email from us with a copy of the presentation. And then each of these, links in here are clickable straight to the resources that we're talking about. So if you do want to do this on your own or have a lot of time, which you may have right now, this is a really, really great activity to do while you're sheltered in. Um, so I'm going to move, keep moving along. The next tip that we I'm talked about picture bumpers or no. Oh yeah. Sorry. I forgot about the picture. That's bumpers. Okay. These are picture bumpers. There's a link in the presentation for them. They cost like 10 cents. Um, it's a little rubber bumper and you just put it, behind your um, behind your frame and it adds a little bit of friction so that it doesn't move on the wall which is That's a really good tip and then the other thing you did mention which I think I skipped over by accident was um, hanging it right using it on two hardware you always want to hang on two points because okay. then it is much much less likely to move um, I avoid wires I always use D rings which are um, just two rings shaped like a D. We have an example. Thank you. Um, just put 
one on one side of the frame and the other on the other. Do not have it hang outside of the frame because it's really annoying to see the hardware. Um, but it should be hung about one third down the piece and then uh, your art will never move. It's really annoying to do a nice gallery wall and then have it always be crooked because you're just going to notice how it's always crooked. <laughs> the other thing that we've done and is you can take paper and you can mock your wall out. You can do it on the floor or on the wall. Yep. So, and that's really helpful too. Even if you have a template, it just, you know, once you're putting it up there, it just may not work. Um, and have a plan. Exactly. Don't just go at it. Right. And, or paint or use painter's tape. Yep. Um, so scaling your art is, is a really big deal from my perspective and your perspective equally. And I think that that's one of the, the biggest issues that I see when I look at art in a room is that it's just, it's either hung incorrectly at the wrong height or it's scaled incorrectly for the wall. So very simply, um, I'll let you speak to, you know, how you define the tip. Sure. So I always support getting one signature piece for one big wall. A lot of people think it's going to be cheaper if I get two pieces. Um, it's not, it's really adds up to be the same cost. And it just is a really nice opportunity to make a space feel more unified and bigger when you use one big wall to put one big piece. Um, I also really support looking at the shape of available space on a wall um, and assessing whether that's a vertical rectangle or a horizontal rectangle or a square. And then put a piece of art there that matches that shape. Uh, it's a really subtle thing again, but it really helps the space feel cohesive when you have horizontal work on horizontal wall. I'm gonna show the work behind me, like horizontal work on horizontal wall. Mm -hmm. um, it just, I'm sorry, vertical work on vertical wall and horizontal work on horizontal wall. It just feels more balanced. And also the center point, that art should center be hung at 57 point. to 60 inches from floor to center of art, which, is interesting because I'm short, which none of you would know by looking at me on this Zoom, but I'm short. So whenever I go into somebody's home, I'm always hanging the art probably instinctually at that height. And then like a taller person will come in and be like, it's too low. Um, but it's not. I mean, that really is the center point. And I think that as a designer, we just naturally know kind of where to place art. Yeah. Um, so use this tip because it'll really help in the future. And, and the, the key I, with that, can I add, Karen, the yeah. key with that is that if you choose 57, if you choose to hang your art at 57, with the center at 57 inches from the floor, then you should do the other art or mirrors or other stuff in the room at that same height. And then that's the, what makes the space feel cohesive. And if it's a big gallery wall, then pretend it's one big piece and do the center of that gallery wall at that same height. And then sometimes what happens is the top of your piece of art is going to end up lining up directly with the door line, you know, like the molding. Yeah. And then it might look kind of off. So at that point then, you should probably shift it, right? Like an inch or two below or above, just so it doesn't look like an error and it's not, everything's not in a straight yeah. line. Yeah, these are, this is a guideline and then you eyeball. Exactly. Everyone's space is different, um, but I agree. You don't want it to look off with architectural lines. So another tip is um, if you are using decorative art, um, one way to you make sure or to ensure, I should say, that your decorative art is um, maybe has a little bit more value is to look at the addition number of the prints. So sometimes decorative art, like, a, would you consider, would they ever put a, an addition number on a, on a clay or just sometimes, on? Prints, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the lower the addition size the lower the total supply. So that means your, your price, your artwork is going to be more expensive potentially or could go up in value, right? And that's yeah. not even in decorative art. That's even in, in um, reproductive prints from a fine artist, correct? Exactly. Yep. A photograph would be, a photograph by fine artist should always have an addition number. Um, and the lower the addition number, the lower the price. And then just to end with, you know, going circling back to decorative art, because not everyone can afford or wants fine art, but when they do, you know, this is a great option for you to contact someone like Catherine. Um, but there is better decorative art. And so we do place a lot of decorative art into people's homes. So we look at paper quality, the printing technique, um, ink saturation, if the artist is embellishing the G clay, which really, you know, makes it more unique. Um, but, and a clay is considered the finest form of reproductive art. It's not like a poster. Um, however, 
they are still, like I said, mass reproduced typically, and they're not going to have the same value. The, the, the advantage is that we are usually able to take a G clay and scale it appropriately, or sometimes we can even change color in it to work with a, with a room if we are using decorative art to fit into a space. Um, so I think that's really helpful when you are looking at something that's decorative is to think about these things um, and also make sure the paper is archival, which is huge. And that the printing, the printer it's coming from is inkjet and it has like really good printing techniques. So and you also do this for clients as you um, talk about framing with the cliche too, to make it yes. sure that the frame works well with the space too. That's huge. Huge, huge, huge. So we are, I don't know if anyone has any questions um, regarding this topic. And I think we are sending out a poll this time. I'm not sure. Hopefully that'll work. <laughs> Again, technically challenged. But um, if you get a poll, I'd love some feedback as to, you know, topics that you might want to see us me touch on in the future. Feedback about how this information is to you. Has it been helpful? Are you learning from it? And are you staying engaged? Um, but I don't know if anyone has any questions. Michelle, I think you're there if you want to. Yes, you have three questions. Okay, go ahead. If you could I'm read. I'm going to try. It says answer live. Well, actually, if I stop my share. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I can maybe see the questions, but I'm not sure. I can't. So I'll let you read them. All right. So for Debbie says, how do you find the artists that you represent? I think this is for you, Catherine. Great question. So I don't represent artists, actually. I work solely on behalf of my clients and give them objective advice. Uh, I find artists that I recommend to clients very organically through word of mouth. We have a database of about 2,000 pieces um, from literally all over the world that we are always adding to and editing. Um, but I do not work on behalf of any specific artist, which enables me to be completely objective. I think that's great. Okay, Michelle. All right, next question is from Jacqueline. What is the best size frame for a gallery wall to use if you don't have a huge wall? 11 by 14 or 16 by 20? Hmm. <laughs> uh, gosh, I think it really depends on the wall and how much space you have in front of that wall. So for narrow hallways, I would keep the pieces on the smaller side. And for wider spaces, I would keep it on the bigger side, like the 16 by, I forget. But I think it also depends on how many photos do you want in that gallery wall. Definitely. So you have to kind of do the math. You have to take the length and the that's why a program like Icovia would help you a lot or one of these pre-formatted templates because you would you have to take the length of the wall and the height of the wall, the number of photos, the inches in between, and then calculate so that you can figure out what your base size is that you're using in the middle as your big size. Yeah, so it's, exactly. kind of, it's kind of mathematical. Oops, it's, it's pretty mathematical. And my first step in any gallery wall is I measure the biggest piece of art that I would ever put on that wall, and then I fill it with frames. Um, so I think what Karen's saying is, I totally agree with you, Karen. Okay. How many pieces do you want, and how much space do you have to breathe in that room? And do we have a third question, Michelle? Um, yeah. So Debbie's asking a suggestion for art above a fireplace with a wall eight feet in height. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know what? Um, it depends, but we're offering a 30 minute free consult to anyone who joins the webinar. So send me a picture and I'll give you my two cents. <laughs> that's a great answer. Um, and that's true. So after this, you will get a 30 minute free consult with Catherine. Um, know that, you know, if you are getting that consult with her, the goal is to look for fine art, but you may just open up a, a dialogue with her for future reference and you can join any one of these, um, guided tours that she does, which I think is amazing. I plan on, if the market ever in the world ever opens up again, which it will, I plan on trying to attend Art Basel next year um, just to learn. I'm, and I asked her, have you. It was so um, much fun. can you come and pay and do this even if you're not, quote, an art collector? And Anyone can. We had um, designers, artists, and collectors at our inaugural art basel guided tour last year and we already have a wait list for next year karen you're on it but um and i want i want to be on the wait list for new york too so 
include yeah me. new york fun miami's better <laughs> no but new york is right here so it's like not an investment if you live in this area totally agree. perspective totally agree and we might do toronto in the fall too depending on Ooh. the world and i think we're all itching to dream about getting out of here so <laughs> definitely keep keep yeah. in touch and you know think about the art advisor and the designer as a team um, yeah. Because I turn to art advisors when I'm looking for that special piece. Mm -hmm. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Next week, I'm so excited as well. We're going to be, or I'm going to be interviewing um, the design director from Philip Jeffries. Um, Philip Jeffries is probably the foremost and leading wallpaper company in the United States. We use their wallpaper in quite a few rooms and we're huge fans. And she's going to be discussing how she creates the stories and the trend stories behind the wallpaper launches. So I'm super excited. Thanks for having me. Thank you. This was great. Thank you, Catherine. Bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs>